Hey, welcome back to another episode in my series on the art of war. Now, today, we'll be going on to the next preface. This one is about the commentators. Sun Tzu can boast an exceptionally long distinguished role of commentators which would do honour to any classic. Wu Yang Su remarks on this fact, though he wrote before the tale was complete, and rather ingeniously explains it by saying that the artifices of war being inexhaustible must therefore be susceptible of treatment in a great variety of ways. 1. Cao Cao or Cao Kong, afterwards known as Wei Wei Qi, from 155 to 220 AD, there is hardly any room for doubt that the earliest commentary on Sun Tzu actually came from the pen of this extraordinary man whose biography in the San Chi reads like a romance. One of the greatest military geniuses that the world has seen, and Napoleonic in the scale of his operations, he was especially famed for the marvellous rapidity of his marches, which has found expression in the line of talk of Tiao Tiao and Tiao Tiao will appear. Hui Yang Sui says of him, He was a great captain who measured his strength against Tung Chao Lu Pu and Tu Yuan, father and son, and vanquished them all. Whereupon he divided the empire of Han with Wu and Shu and made himself king. It is recorded that whenever a counsellor of war was held, it is recorded that whenever a council of war was held by way on the eve of far-reaching campaign, he had all his calculations ready. Those generals who made use of them did not lose one battle in ten. Those who ran counter to them in any particular saw their armies incontinently beaten and put out to flight. Xiao Kung's notes on Sun Tzu, models of austere brevity, are so thoroughly characteristic of the stern commander known to history that it is hard indeed to conceive of them as the work of a mere literateur. Sometimes indeed, owing to extreme compression, they are scarcely intelligible and stand no less in need of a commentary than the text itself. Two, Meng Shi, the commentary which has come down to us under this name is comparatively meagre, and nothing about the author is known. Even his personal name has not been recorded. Qi Tian Pao's edition places him after Qi Lin and Xiao Kong. Wu also assigns him to the Qiang dynasty. But this is a mistake. In Sun Yan's preface, he appears as Meng Shi of the Liang dynasty from 502 to 557. Others would identify with Meng Kangs of the 3rd century. He is named in one work as the last of the five commentators, the others being Wei Wu Qi, Tu Mu, Qian Hao, and Chilin. 3. Li Chuan of the 8th century was a well-known writer on military tactics. One of his works had been in constant use down to the present day. The Chang Chi mentions lives of famous generals from the Chao to the Chiang dynasty, as written by him. According to Chao Kung Wu and the Tian Ikou catalogue, he followed a variant of the text 
or Sun Tzu, which differs considerably from those now extant. His notes are most short and to the point, and he frequently illustrates his remarks by anecdotes from Chinese history. For, to you did not publish a separate commentary on Sun Tzu, his notes being taken from Chong Tian, the encyclopedic treatise on the constitution which was his life work. They are largely repetitious of Chao Kung and Meng Shi, besides which it is believed that he drew on the ancient commentaries of Wang Ling and others. Owing to the peculiar arrangement of Chong Tian, he has to explain each passage on its merits apart from the context, and sometimes his own explanation does not agree with that of Xiao Kung, whom he always quotes first. Though not strictly to be reckoned as one of the ten commentators, he was added to their number by Qi Tian Pao being wrongly placed after his grandson, Tumu. 5. Tumu is perhaps the best known as a poet. A bright star even in the glorious galaxy of the Tang period. We learn from Chao Kyung Wu that although he had no practical experience of war, he was extremely fond of discussing the subject, and was moreover well read in military history of the Chon Chu and Chang Kyu eras. His notes, therefore, are well worth attention. They are very copious and replete with historical parallels. The gist of Sun Tzu's work is thus summarized by him. Practice benevolence and justice, but on the other hand, make full use of artifice and measures of expediency. He further declares that all the military triumph and disasters of the thousand years which had elapsed since Sun Tzu's death would, upon examination, be found to uphold and corroborate in every particular the maxims contained in his book. Chi Mu's somewhat spiteful charge against Xiao Kung had already been considered elsewhere. 6. Chen Hao appears to have been a contemporary of Tu Mu. Chao Kung Wu says that he was impelled to write a new commentary on Sun Tzu because Chao Kung's, on the other hand, was too obscure and subtle, and that of Chu Mu, on the other hand, too long-winded and diffuse. Wu Yang Su, writing in the middle of the 11th century, calls Chao Kung, Chu Mu, and Chen Hao the three chief commentators on Sun Tzu, and observes that Chen Hiao is continually attacking Chu Mu's shortcomings. His commentary, though not lacking in merit, must rank below those of his predecessors. 7. Chia Lin is known to have lived under the Tang dynasty, for his commentary on Sun Tzu is mentioned in the Tang Shu and afterwards republished by Qi Xie of the same dynasty together with those of Meng Shi and Tu Yu. It is of somewhat scanty texture and in point of quality too perhaps the least valuable of the eleven. Eight. Mei Yao Chen from 1002 to 1060. Commonly known by his style as Mei Sheng Yu, was, like Chu Mu, a poet of distinction. His commentary was published with a laudatory preface by the great Wu Yang Su, from which we may cull the following. 
Later scholars have misread Sang Su, distorting his words and trying to make them square with their own one-sided views. Thus, though commentators have not been lacking, only a few have proved equal to the task. My friend Sheng Yu has not fallen into this mistake. In attempting to provide a critical commentary for Sun Tzu's work, he does not lose sight of the fact that these sayings were intended for states engaged in internecine warfare that the author is not concerned with the military conditions prevailing under the sovereigns of the three ancient dynasties, nor with the nine punitive measures prescribed to the minister of war. Again, Sun Wu loved brevity of diction, but his meaning is always deep. Whether the subject be marching an army, or handling soldiers, or estimating the enemy, or controlling the forces of victory, it is always systematically treated. The sayings are bound together in the strict logical sequence, though this has been obscured by the commentators who have probably failed to grasp their meaning. In his own commentary, Mei Sheng Yu has brushed aside all the obstinate prejudices of these critics, and has tried to bring out the true meaning of Sun Tzu himself. In this way, the clouds of confusion have been dispersed, and the sayings made clear. I am convinced that the present work deserves to be handed down side by side with the three great commentaries, and for a great deal that they find in the sayings, coming generations will have constant reason to thank my friend Shang Yu. Making some allowance for the exuberance of friendship, I am inclined to endorse this favourable judgement and would certainly place him above Chen Hiao in order of merit. 9. Wang Sui, also of the Sung dynasty, is decidedly original in some of his interpretations, but much less judicious than Mei Yao Chen, and on the whole not a very trustworthy guide. He is fond of comparing his own commentary with that of Xiao Kung, but the comparison is not often flattering to him. We learn from Xiao Kung filling up lacune and correcting mistakes. 10. Ho Yang Si of the Sung Dynasty. The personal name of this commentator is given above by Cheng Chao in the Chung Chi, written about the middle of the 12th century, but he appears simply as Ho Shi in the Yu Hei, and Mei Chun Lin quotes the Chao Kung Wu as saying that his personal name is unknown. There seems to be no reason to doubt Cheng Chao's statement, otherwise I should have been inclined to hazard a guess and identify with one Ho Chu Yu Fei, the author of a short treatise on war, who lived in the latter part of the 11th century. Ho Shi's commentary in the words of the Cheni Kao catalogues contains helpful additions here and there, but is chiefly remarkable for the copious extracts taken in adapted form from the dynastic histories and other sources. And finally, 11. Chang Yu, the list closes with a commentator of no great originality perhaps, but gifted with admirable powers of lucid exposition. His commentator is based on that of the Tiao Kung 
whose terse sentences he contrives to expand and develop in masterly fashion. Without Chang Yu, it is safe to say that much of Chiao Kung's commentary would have remained cloaked in its pristine obscurity, and therefore valueless. His work is not mentioned in Sung's history, the Chung Kao, or the Yu Hui, but it finds a niche in the Chung Chi, which also names him as the author of Lives of Famous Generals. It is rather remarkable that the last named four should have all flourished within so short a space of time. Chao Kyung Wu accounts for it by saying, During the early years of the Sung dynasty, the empire enjoyed a long spell of peace, and men ceased to practice the art of war. But when Chao Yung Kyao's rebellion came, and the frontier generals were defeated time after time, the court made strenuous inquiry for men skilled in war, and military topics became the vogue amongst all the high officials. Hence it is that the commentators of Sung Tzu and our dynasty belong mainly to that period. Besides these eleven commentators, there are several others whose work has not come down to us. The Sui Shu mentions four, namely Wang Ling, often quoted by Chu Yu as Wang Zhu, Chang Su Shang, Chia Tzu of Wei, and Shen Yu of Wu. The Chang Shu adds Sun Hao as the Chung Shi Xiao Qi, while the Chu Shu mentions a Ming commentator. Huang Jun Yu it is possible that some of these may have been merely collectors and editors of other commentaries, like Qi Tian Pao and Qi Xie, mentioned above. And that is the end of that preface to The Art of War. I hope that you're enjoying this opportunity to have a pause have a rest, have a break, have a reprieve, and thank you for listening. Good night.